Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shahina Simons, and I'm Chief of the Educational Opportunities Section in the Civil Rights Division at the Department of Justice. On behalf of the division, I have the privilege of welcoming you to today's program, which honors the memory of a singular voice for justice and equality, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Before we begin our program, I have a few housekeeping announcements. Closed captioning and sign language interpretation are being provided today. The event program, which contains the agenda and the speaker bios, is available to view in the chat. We are honored to be joined by so many distinguished speakers for today's commemoration of Dr. King's life. And we welcome all of you who are in the audience for this program, including all of our colleagues at the Civil Rights Division and the Department of Justice. Your work each day honors Dr. King's legacy of service and pursuit of justice. At the outset, I wanna thank Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, Kristen Clark, for leading today's program and for leading the division's work to carry Dr. King's dream forward. Work that remains so necessary, so unfinished and so urgent. AAG Clark started her career right here in the Civil Rights Division. She then joined the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund and went on to lead the Civil Rights Bureau of the New York Attorney General's Office and the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. Today's program features remarks from and conversations between civil rights leaders whose life's work has been to challenge injustice and inequality. And we will also hear from a panel of young people, the heart of any movement, who are part of the next generation of civil rights leaders working to strengthen their communities and further the cause of justice. We hope that you find inspiration from these speakers to continue on your own journeys, both personal and professional. To get us started, the Attorney General of the United States, Merrick B. Garland, will deliver the opening remarks. Since his confirmation as the 86th Attorney General, A.G. Garland has made the enforcement of civil rights one of the department's top priorities. As we begin today's observance, I'm pleased to share with you all this video message from the Attorney General. Everyone, it is my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Department of Justice and our Civil Rights Division to this convening honoring the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. As we commemorate what would have been Dr. King's 93rd birthday, it is a fitting time to reflect on the tireless conviction and courage that defined his work and his life and on the many lessons he continues to teach us. One lesson, particularly relevant to our work at the Justice Department, is that, quote, human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Every step toward the goal of justice requires sacrifice, suffering, and struggle, the tireless exertions and passionate concern of dedicated individuals. We know that progress in our democracy is not and has never been steady. Instead, it demands constant vigilance. Our own history here at the Justice Department makes that clear. As I have noted several times before, protecting civil rights was one of the founding purposes of the Justice Department over 150 years ago. Founded in the wake of the Civil War and in the midst of Reconstruction, the department's first principal task was to secure the civil rights promised by the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. This meant confronting the Ku Klux Klan, which used violence and threats of violence prevent black Americans from exercising their right to vote. It would be almost a century after reconstruction before Congress again passed major civil rights legislation. The Civil Rights Act of 1957 created the Civil Rights Division within the department with the mission, quote, to uphold the civil and constitutional rights of all Americans, particularly some of the most vulnerable members of our society. Dr. King and the civil rights movement's persistent call to action led to the passage of subsequent laws, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, 
the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Fair Housing Act of 1968. Their extraordinary efforts to get these laws enacted gave the Justice Department some of our most important tools with which to protect Americans' civil rights. Roughly 20 years after the Civil Rights Division was created, Drew Days, an attorney who began his legal career working with Dr. King to combat housing discrimination in Chicago, and later worked as first assistant counsel for the Legal Defense Fund, became the assistant attorney general for the Civil Rights Division. Drew was the first person who had worked as a civil rights attorney outside the department and the first black person to lead the Civil Rights Division, or any DOJ division for that matter. As Assistant Attorney General, Drew aggressively enforced the civil rights laws. He also served as an important mentor to me during and after my first stint at DOJ, as well as to Lonnie Guineer, who worked for Drew at the department and went on to a distinguished career in academia and civil rights advocacy, and whose passing we mourn this week. Drew was the first but not the last outstanding civil rights organization alum to lead the Civil Rights Division. Deval Patrick, Bill Lan Lee, and Jocelyn Samuels, among others, followed in his footsteps. I am proud that DOJ continues that tradition today with Assistant Attorney General Kristen Clark, as well as with Associate Attorney General Vanita Gupta, who is herself a former head of the Civil Rights Division. What a great leadership team we have. In our tenure here at the department, the mission to protect civil rights remains urgent. We remember the words of Dr. King, that progress is not automatic or inevitable, and that every step requires, quote, the tireless exertions and passionate concern of dedicated individuals. We remember this as we work to protect the civil rights of every person. We remember this as we use every authority we have to protect the right of every eligible citizen to vote. We remember this as we use all the tools at our disposal to deter, prevent, and prosecute hate crimes. We remember this as we seek to advance environmental justice, to make equal access to justice a reality for all Americans, and to address inequities in the criminal justice system. And we remember the obligation we have to protect American civil rights and liberties in all the work we do, in every investigation and every case, and as we fulfill every one of our responsibilities. I am proud of how the Justice Department has worked to protect civil rights over the past 10 months. But we are under no illusions about the enormity of the work we have left to do. I would be remiss if I did not highlight the challenges we face in the effort to protect voting rights. As you all know too well, the Supreme Court's 2013 decision in the Shelby County case effectively eliminated the preclearance protections of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, which had been the department's most effective tool for protecting voting rights over the past half century. Subsequent decisions have substantially narrowed the reach of Section 2 as well. Since those decisions, there has been a dramatic increase in legislative enactments that make it harder for millions of eligible voters to vote and to elect representatives of their own choosing. The Department of Justice has and will continue to do all it can to protect voting rights with the enforcement powers we have but it is essential that Congress act to give de the department the powers we need to ensure that every eligible voter can cast a vote that counts. In an editorial published after his death, the great John Lewis recalled another important lesson taught by Dr. King. Quote, he said, each of us has a moral obligation to stand up, speak up, and speak out. When you see something that is not right, you must say something. You must do something. I repeat those words often because the Justice Department has the same moral obligation. 
So we will continue to stand up, speak up, speak out, and act. And we will continue to work alongside all of you to advance the ideals to which Dr. King dedicated his life. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Attorney General Garland, Associate Attorney General Gupta, Shahina Simons, our speakers and panelists, and everyone who has joined us today for our virtual celebration of the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Dr. King has had a tremendous impact on all our lives and his legacy of hope and his fierce commitment to justice and equality remain present in our day-to-day -day work at the Civil Rights Division. We are so fortunate to have lawyers from inside and outside of government and civil rights leaders and advocates with us today who have also shared in the fight for justice and equality. I'm truly honored to be among them and to talk about how Dr. King's legacy as an American and as a leader inspired them and affected their work. For decades, the Civil Rights Division has upheld Dr. King's legacy and fought for equal justice under law. Unfortunately, today our fight is not over and we face new and even more insidious challenges to our dream of creating a just and equal society. Under this administration, the Department of Justice has rededicated its resources towards combating these challenges and protecting the most vulnerable in our society from discrimination and hate based on their race, religion, national origin, sexual orientation, disability, or any other protected class. The Biden administration has put justice and equity at the forefront of its policy agenda. On the day he took office, President Biden signed the executive order on advancing racial equity and supporting underserved communities through federal government. Under Attorney General Garland, the Civil Rights Division has focused on reimagining justice and using our resources to expand our work by bringing new cases in areas including voting rights, hate crimes, environmental justice, police accountability, prison conditions, fair housing and fair lending, and much more. Attorney General Garland's very first directive to the Justice Department was to order an expedited internal review to determine how the department could deploy all the tools at its disposal to counter the ugly and sharp rise in hate crimes and hate incidents, especially against the Asian and Pacific Islander community. This includes increased law enforcement training and coordination, improved incident reporting, and more aggressive community outreach. In another area, the Civil Rights Division recently opened its very first Title VI environmental justice investigation. And that investigation is looking into whether the Alabama Department of Public Health and the Lowndes County Health Department operate their wastewater disposal program and infectious diseases and outbreaks program in a manner that discriminates against black residents of Lowndes County, Alabama. Longtime civil rights advocates will be familiar with Lowndes County. During the height of the civil rights movement in 1965, there was not a single registered black voter in Lowndes County despite the fact that Black people made up 80% of the county's population. This investigation serves as a reminder that despite the tremendous progress made in advancing racial justice, the legacy of Jim Crow runs deep, and there is still significant work we have yet to accomplish. Acknowledging this history, the Civil Rights Division has reaffirmed its commitment to protecting voting rights. In June of last year, Attorney General Garland denoted the proliferation of state laws restricting access to the ballot and committed to doubling the division's enforcement staff to protect the right to vote. Last week in his remarks on the first anniversary of the attack on the Capitol, 
the Attorney General expressed that the protection of voting rights is a priority throughout the department and at the highest levels of DOJ. And this week, speaking from Atlanta, Georgia, President Biden described the right to vote and the right to have that vote counted as democracy's threshold liberty. This has been a priority within the Civil Rights Division as well. This year, the division has brought multiple lawsuits and filed multiple statements of interest to protect voting rights for all Americans, especially for our nation's most vulnerable. As our country continues to struggle with institutionalized racism and harm against mar marginalized communities, the division has also worked to create and strengthen trust between communities and the government. This year alone, we've opened pattern or practice investigations into police departments in Louisville, Kentucky, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Mount Vernon, New York, and Phoenix, Arizona. The department indicted police officers for misconduct in Minnesota and Louisiana, and the department opened an investigation of Georgia's state prisons to examine whether prisoners are subject to violence, understaffing, and sexual abuse of gay, lesbian, and transgender prisoners. We also opened an investigation into juvenile detention facilities across the state of Texas. We stand ready to protect the rights of children who end up in these facilities, and our investigation will ensure the treatment of these children comports with the Constitution. In the last few months, we've also launched our most aggressive and coordinated effort to date to combat redlining, one of the most longstanding and pernicious forms of lending discrimination. This work is about leveling the playing field when it comes to home ownership in our country. And of course, this work ties directly to Dr. King's efforts to promote economic justice and fair housing. Dr. King's legacy has shown us that social justice and civil rights requires us to step up and demand access and fairness in all aspects of American life. During my tenure here in the Civil Rights Division at the Justice Department, I've made it my mission to remain steady along the path that Dr. King carved out for us. I look forward to continuing that journey with the core tenant that Dr. King has taught us that we can and must work together to create not just our American dream, but our dream America. Today, I am delighted to welcome two extraordinary American leaders and civil rights leaders in their own right. Governor Deval Patrick, who served as the 71st governor of Massachusetts and previously held my position as the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights. And Sherilyn Eiffel, the current President and Director Counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Thank you both so much for being here with me today. I'm so grateful to the both of you for joining this year's commemoration of Dr. King. It's an honor. Thank you, General Clark. Well to be here. Welcome. Well to be here. In our conversation today, I'd like to talk about the legacy of Dr. King and the civil rights movement. I wanna talk about this moment that we're in right now in our country and discuss where we can go from here as we fight our way towards a more just, equal and equitable society. So my first question, I'm gonna to direct to Governor Patrick. Uh, Deval, you served as Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights under President Clinton, and during your confirmation hearing, you quoted Dr. King saying, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. During your time at the helm of the division, you fiercely defended policies to promote racial equity through efforts like affirmative action. You worked against racial profiling and misconduct. So I have a two-part question for you. First, how did you approach racial justice and equity work while leading the Civil Rights Division? And second, what lessons did you learn about how the struggle for racial justice and equal equality has changed and evolved over time? Hmm. 
two questions and both of them hard. I, I will say that, <clears throat> Kristen, when I, when I first got the job, I asked the president and his team at the White House what the agenda was supposed to be. And, uh, and all they said to me was vigorous enforcement. And I asked uh, Attorney General Reno what in particular she wanted us to emphasize. And she said, vigorous enforcement. It's like the talking points have been spread around to everybody. And, you know, first and foremost, the job is a law enforcement job. Uh, and I think in order to get vigorous enforcement, part of the assignment, as I appreciated, uh, appreciated it, was to sort of unlock and unleash all this amazing talent on the staff after 12 years of, uh, of what felt from the outside, and I think for many in the, on the inside as, a, as sort of Republican kind of thumb on the uh, on activity. So we tried to get active in lots of, uh, of areas. And we, of course, also, uh, importantly, had to keep in balance the fact that there is justice for others, other protected groups, so-called, um, that was part of the agenda as well, that the justice of, uh, of uh, people with disabilities or um, women, uh, folks who are facing religious discrimination and, and so on were also an important part of the agenda. I think among the lessons I learned, one, I mentioned that the staff is awesome. Um, there's just deep talent and commitment and, they, uh, and that talent and commitment runs deep no matter who is in charge and no matter what the administration. And I, I respect uh, that and I'm grateful for it as a, as a citizen. I think another lesson that came home uh, hard is that um, though, uh, though the issue is justice, the decisions that you make in the division are sort of um, predictably political. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that we have, uh, you know, sort of navigating our national ambivalence around uh, racial justice has been political from the start. Um, and that part does not uh, does not go away. I think racial, racial justice is fundamentally about patriotism. It is about whether uh, ultimately the values on which we are founded, um, the the values to which we pledge allegiance, are uh, things we actually mean. And keeping that front of mind and calling that out was a part of what I felt my role was. Um, as, uh, as head of the division, and I think, frankly, is how I've thought of my role um, in whatever leadership position I've had. I want to turn next to Sherilyn. Um, I know that you recently spoke about rejoining uh, the Legal Defense Fund at a really powerful moment in the country. We were experiencing social upheaval including a wave of restrictions on voting rights. We were, uh, communities were dealing with the tragic murder of Trayvon Martin. And LDF works on so many different fronts to combat discrimination, racial inequality, and social, justice, social injustice. I was wondering if you could talk about how Dr. King's broad intersectional concept of racial justice, which includes both economic and social justice, affected your outlook and how you have approached the, the work and business of defending civil rights. Thank you so much, Kristen. And um, I, I love seeing you in that seat. And it's always good to be with Duval, who I admire so much. Um, you know, it's a great question and I'm so glad you asked it because I think this is so critical for people to remember about Dr. King. Um, you know, I think people remember all of the soaring speeches um, but they don't really um, deal with really how brilliant he was in recognizing the connectedness of so many of the individual issues of justice and equality and dignity. His great talent, um, his great anointing was that he knew how to weave together the story for us of what a just society, a beloved community looks like in all its component parts. And so for me, um, I've always thought of it that way. And it was really reinforced for me by Lonnie Guineer, who the Attorney General referenced um, when we opened earlier um, and who you know, passed away last week. Um, Lonnie is the person who hired me as a young lawyer at the Legal Defense Fund. And so I started out my voting rights work with her as my 
remote supervisor, no pressure at all. Uh, and, um, and what I remember she talked about and what she wrote in some of her earliest scholarship was about what those voting rights activists in the 1950s and 60s thought voting rights meant. And what she said, and I repeat it often, um, especially to our staff, is that those voting activists like Fannie Lou Hamer and Dr. King and so many others believed that access to the political process and the right to vote would allow Black people to change the material condition of their lives and their communities. It wasn't just a ceremonial act. Of That's course, right. it is a reflection of full citizenship and an express, expression of full citizenship. But it was meant to empower Black people to be able to address many of the other conditions that we are facing. Um, and so when Dr. King gave his speech, give us the ballot, which so many people refer to and appropriately so, people forget that the speech was given on May 7th, 1957, on the anniversary of the Brown versus Board of Education decision. And it was a civil rights leaders gathering at the Lincoln Memorial to protest Southern resistance to implementation of Brown. And when you read the speech, what Dr. King is saying, give us the ballot so that we can elect judges who will be just. Give us the ballot so that we can elect representatives who will carry our voice forward. Give us the ballot so that we can elect people who will understand what a criminal justice system is supposed to be and so on and so forth. So it never was separated into the areas that we so often find it separated. In fact, one of the first things I did when I came to the Legal Defense Fund was drop all of our project walls. So we didn't have individual projects anymore because I wanted us to be able to work at the intersection. If you're engaged in work trying to restore the right to vote to formerly incarcerated people, or you're trying to ensure that formerly incarcerated people are not illegally kept from uh, being able to obtain employment, is that employment discrimination, is that criminal justice, is that voting rights? It's all of the above, it's all woven together. Um, and so I think Dr. King really exemplified that. And of course, the part that you know really was his special anointing was that he tied to it the condition of our souls and spirits, that he tied to it the sense of who we are as individual people in relationship to one another, to all of these areas of injustice um, and to the way in which it affects us as human beings. So I, I so appreciate that question because it's actually quite important to me. And I, I'm just grateful also to, to Lani, uh, to Lani Guineer for having such um, a, a, a deep and community-based understanding of what we were doing when we were litigating all of those cases that we were trying to put in the hands of the people we represent the tools to address so many other uh, injustices and ills in their communities. Yeah, yeah I, um... Lonnie Grunier was a tremendous inspiration to me. And uh, what, a, what a loss uh, for those who care deeply about democracy and about civil rights in our country. Um, Deval, I, I wanna talk with you about a problem that Dr. King dealt with and that frankly our nation has wrestled with for centuries, hate crimes, mm -hmm. racial violence, white supremacy. Now, Black churches are important and sacred institutions within the Black community and our religious institutions generally, be they synagogues or mosques or other houses of worship are uh, incredibly important but are too often targeted by people who espouse hateful views. In Dr. King's time, acts of terror at ch churches were used to strike fear and undermine the fight for justice. We remember the four little black girls killed in 1963 at a church bombing in Birmingham, Alabama. We remember the murder of nine peaceful worshipers in Charleston, South Carolina in 2015 and more. And I know that during your tenure at the Civil Rights Division, you investigated and prosecuted a rash of arsons and attacks at black churches across the South. Can you talk about some of that work and why it was so important for the department to take a role 
in investigating uh, those arsons and working to protect Black churches and share your thoughts on how we can work to best confront the problem of hate today? Well, <clears throat> thank you for the, for the question. I, I want to, maybe I'll start my answer by acknowledging and remembering my friend Lonnie Guineer too, um, who, uh, but for whom I wouldn't have had the job. Remember, I was the second or third choice. Um, it was she who uh, introduced me uh, to then Governor Clinton when we were both at the Legal Defense Fund and we, and we sued him in a, in a voting rights uh, case. Um, and uh, it was she who got across the um, uh, really valuable and lasting lesson that it's, that it's important, I think as Sherilyn was saying so well, to, to see the people, not just the point that these were not abstract things we were talking about. They were ways in which individuals um, were able to make the very best of their own lives and circumstances and to lift themselves uh, from their circumstances of, uh, of birth as we would, as we once believed that any citizen should uh, in America. And I think that when I think about the attacks on black churches you mentioned earlier, Black churches have been a place of uh, uh, sanctuary and a source of sanctuary for Black communities for a very, very long time, and attackers know that. They know that. Some of those churches were burned to the ground when no one was there, so it wasn't necessarily about hurting people in every case, in the cases that we uh, investigated, but it was very much about striking a blow at the psychology, the sense of safety, the sense of community. Um, and um, uh, so the attackers understood that. And frankly, so did the president and the attorney general. Um, we, the Church Arson Task Force at the time, Kristen, was the largest criminal investigation in uh, United States history. And we did it together with um, the Treasury Department. I co-chaired that task force with my counterpart at Treasury because ATF at the time was over in Treasury and we needed both the FBI and ATF uh, on these investigations. I will say that just getting them to play nice together was a big part of the assignment. But um, I think we got a lot of good work done. And I think we, um, it was important to respond to those uh, attacks because, um, because hate, what we called then hate, and now uh, don't call often enough domestic terrorism, is a present and uh, lingering threat, not just to general stability, but to the, uh, uh, to the integrity uh, of the democracy. And, and the Justice Department has a role uh, in stepping up um, uh, and fighting back. Um, Sherilyn, I want to turn to you next. Um, you know, in addition to leaders who are moving between the government and your organization, the Legal Defense Fund, um, the Civil Rights Division and LDF have had overlapping dockets in a few areas throughout the years. For example, both the division and the Legal Defense Fund have had very significant school desegregation dockets. And the division and LDF remain co-plaintiffs on dozens of school desegregation cases in the South. A deputy chief in our education section, Franz Marshall, uh, who has served for decades here in the division, has worked hand in hand with LDF to desegregate countless school districts over five decades. So Sherilyn, I wanted to ask you to talk a bit about the roles that uh, the Justice Department and outside organizations have to play in working together to protect existing uh, civil rights and, ex and frankly working to expand the protections of civil rights. Dr. King often advocated for government to take a more proactive role in protecting civil rights. So how does this legacy shape the way that LDF and frankly how other civil rights organizations have approached current civil rights issues? You know, if we needed a lesson on the value of um, what should be the alignment between the Department of Justice, you know, and its civil rights division and civil rights organizations operating outside um, of the government, we had the, the last uh, four years of the prior administration. 
in which um, we did not have that partnership. And um, the truth is that the Department of Justice and your division and all of your teams working together um, have considerably more resources in man and woman power um, and, and reach um, than any individual civil rights organization. And the, you even have um, you know, statutes that, that are available to you that are not available to us. Um, I'm thinking here about policing and your ability to bring um, these pattern and practice cases. Now we of course can sue police departments and we have, LDF was part of the consortium of organizations that sued the NYPD for stop and, stop and frisk constitutional violations. That suit took years and countless organizations working together and countless resources um, of strapped civil rights organizations to be able to bring that case. And we're still monitoring uh, those consent decrees. And I think everyone would agree that the problems are not all fully solved. So when the Department of Justice um, pulls out of that work as they did in the last administration, it matters because it leaves the field bereft. Very few of our organizations have the resources to be able to do the kind of data collection and so forth to stand those cases up. And that is something that the Department of Justice is in, empowered to do. And when you do it and do it in an aggressive way, it can be powerful and important. And so the restart in your division, Kristen, of pattern and practice investigations uh, since the beginning of last year is one of the most important things that has happened uh, since the new administration has come in. It serves as a warning to police departments that regularly engage in unconstitutional policing, but it also provides a pathway and an apparatus for beginning to get into the systemic uh, problems and discrimination that infects so many law enforcement uh, agencies around the country. The same is true of voting legislation where we often partner. Um, again, when I was a young LDF lawyer, the Department of Justice was our co-counsel in a case called Chisholm versus Edwards. Uh, challenging um, judicial elections in, um, in Louisiana. Um, and so I was used to this model of the partnership uh, that can exist between LDF and the Department of Justice. And that was important uh, to us. We always feel that the Department of Justice are the big guns and um, that there are certain circumstances in which we need you all to really show up uh, in ways that we can't. And you also have the, um, you know, frankly, the kind of real enforcement power on the ground, the ability to send monitors, the ability of your U.S. attorneys to address um, the rise of uh, voter intimidation that we are seeing lately, the threats that are happening against election officials. Um, these are things, you know, civil rights organizations are not law enforcement agencies, to go back to Duval Duval's opening. Um, you all are the, are the top law enforcement officers of the United States, and that includes civil rights enforcement. So you have a very important, independent, um, but collateral and, and sometimes integrated and overlapping role to play in the civil rights ecostructure of this country. Um, and the, the work that was done since 1957 in standing up the Civil Rights Division and the work that was done thereafter in really strengthening the tools available to the Department of Justice uh, really has been critical to the kind of norming of civil rights uh, litigation and, and uh, civil rights advocacy in this country, uh, because it's a big country and not one of our organizations can take it all on in all of its dimensions. Um, what, what I regret is that, um, you know, this has become something that is so deeply partisan uh, that we could see what we saw in the last administration. When I was at LDF, um, there, was, there was a Republican president, and yet we were still co-counsel with the Department of Justice in the Chisholm case. Uh, we were still co you know, the Department of Justice still argued uh, on our side in the Houston lawyers case. Uh, we could still count on the possibilities of those partnerships, um, but they're, they're critically important as a matter of just resources, as a matter of power, as a matter of reach, um, and as a matter of being able to get at issues that independent civil rights organi organizations just cannot, and just to make reference to the conversation you were just having with uh, Governor Patrick uh, about hate crimes, um, you know, this is, this is a law enforcement issue. Um, or if we talk about, you know, white supremacist infiltration in, in, in law enforcement, these are not matters that um, an organization like LDF or the Lawyers Committee uh, can take on on their own. We can bring civil suits where we can, 
But these are deep law enforcement matters that really require the Department of Justice's engagement, interaction, strength, and authority to, um, to be able to make change happen. I want to um, take a, a moment now to ask you both about the progress we still need to make. And both of you have kind of touched on uh, some of the current day problems that we're up against. But would you both briefly reflect on what you think are, are the absolute biggest challenges facing our current generation of civil rights advocates? And share your thoughts on what issues would uh, that you would prioritize as we move forward. Carolyn, you go first. Okay. Um, well, we are in a moment of democratic crisis, um, a moment of crisis that I have not seen in my lifetime. And it's important to say it, and it's important to confront it because we cannot change what we don't confront. Um, and it's very real. The threats are real. Um, certainly, in the in the context of voting rights, we know what those what those threats are. We know it's voter suppression. We know it's gerrymandering. Um, but 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 what what's even more important is that um, it, it appears that that now there are tens of millions of Americans who are no longer um, dedicated to the idea that we must be a democracy. Mm. That that the that the underpinnings of a democracy are necessary. So there are tens of millions of Americans and leaders of, of, of political parties and, and major leaders around the country, elected leaders, who no longer believe that, who don't believe the rule of law um, means that we must apply it to people on every level. Um, and that sometimes the rule of law does not work in my favor, but it is nevertheless necessary. Um, there are people who no longer believe that they must accept election outcomes that they don't like, that don't favor them. There are people who believe that um, there are ideas and books uh, and aspects of our history that should not be studied and should, should not be told and should not and should be memory hold, um, and that we should no longer tell the truth about. There are uh, tens of millions of people who believe that it is okay for um, armed officers of the state to beat and kill whoever they want. And that what is most important is the solidarity of that group of armed officers and their silence and protection of one another. These are the kinds of things that if we see them in another country, we know exactly what that means. We know what the end of democracy looks like. And I, I believe all of those signs are here in this country and they have been normalized um, by, by those at the highest levels. And in fact, there are many Americans who now embrace this as a way of having the America that they want to see. That is the, the biggest problem facing us today. And the reason why I call it, uh, you know, as I see it in this way, is because it requires us to do some dramatic and drastic things if we are to interrupt uh, this movement. And that means that we all have to stand in positions of discomfort. Um, I have, uh, you know, the last five years, the, the kinds of work that we've done at the Legal Defense Fund in some instances has been work we never expected to do. I never expected to sue the United States Postal Service to try to get ballots delivered on time. Mm. I the United States Postal Service. It was the same year they had issued the Gwen Eiffel stamp, um, but it had to be done. You know, we've all had to do things. We brought suits under the KKK Act last year, too, um, which I had never done before. So um, everyone is required to move out of their comfort zone if we are to um, save American democracy. And that means that, you know, Senate rules like the filibuster rule cannot stand in the way of ensuring the protection of the right to vote. That means that we have to be aggressive about ensuring that white supremacists are not infiltrating law enforcement offices around the country. That means we have to be serious about the conditions in our prisons that are inhumane. That means that we have to be serious and wedded to telling the truth about our history and unafraid to confront the reality of ongoing white supremacy in our country. Um, all of those things, we have to arm ourselves with the courage 
to be able to step into, into this moment. You, you see why I thought Sherilyn should go first. Um, I, I, I think, first of all, I think in this country, we have always had a problem, at least for most of my life, in uh, striking that balance between acknowledging the progress we have made at the same time we acknowledge the progress that must be made. Um, having said that, I think Sherilyn is, is exactly right. We are facing a democratic crisis right now. And I would say that that crisis is um, as deep as she described, and maybe broader, because um, there are folks who both wish to suppress the vote and others who have it who don't think the vote matters, don't think their own participation counts for anything. It may be counted, but that it doesn't count. And when I look around and I see the level of economic insecurity, of social isolation as measured by things like, you know, addiction rates or suicide rates, the, the, um, the way so many people feel that um, those issues become issues at election time and then disappear in between elections. And I hear those kinds of sentiments coming out of white working class communities or rural communities. And I think to myself, that's what we've been feeling in black urban communities for generations. And the notion that that isn't an opportunity for us to see our stake again in each other, that the democracy when it functions is good for all of us, that this advocacy isn't just about, um, and, and isn't only about is the way to put it, I think, um, marginalized, people and communities. It is about making the democracy work and function and have integrity for everybody. And I think, so uh, yes, we need to fix our voting systems, but we also need to engage people on why voting matters. Um, and I think from that, as Dr. King said, and as Sherilyn alluded to early, earlier, we get that right. And an awful lot of the other solutions are, uh, are to things ranging from uh, housing and other economic uh, justice questions to uh, uh, to a, a failed criminal justice uh, system, uh, those solutions begin to feel within reach again. So I've got a final question for uh, you both. You talked about uh, progress, the progress we've made and the road that we've got to still travel. Um, I was wondering if you could both help us close out this part of our program by talking a little bit about how uh, Dr. King and his legacy has personally affected the work that you have chosen to do and the way that you approach that work. When we look back at Dr. King's legacy, what is the most important piece of wisdom or advice that we should continue to use to shape our work as we move forward? Well, I'll start here. I'll just say that um, back to this notion that civil rights and racial justice, um, that reconciliation is not the business of uh, the division alone, uh, is not about uh, one race of people alone. It is about the American experiment and all of us having a stake in that. And so when I saw those huge crowds a summer ago, uh, out making uh, their presence felt around the murder of, uh, of George Floyd and how those crowds overwhelmingly peaceful um, and uh, had every kind of person. And I saw it continue despite our chronically short uh, attention span in this country. I thought to myself, maybe, just maybe, we might grasp again that this struggle is everybody's struggle and it's up to each and every one of us to call those big questions that Sherilyn asked of ourselves uh, and to answer uh, with justice in mind. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing were it not for Dr. King. Um, when I was a little girl, my, every year there would be a show on television in New York, and Kristen, you may remember this, although you're quite somewhat younger than me, um, it used to be called, uh, it was called uh, From Montgomery to Memphis, and it was a documentary about Dr. King, and it would come on every year in New York, and my father would make us watch it. 
Um, and I've said before that what, what made me want to do this work was what I saw to be the extraordinary nobility um, of people who, for whom America was not really working, devoting themselves to the cause of making it work for their families and their communities, having no guarantees of what the outcome would be. And it's not just Dr. King, obviously, it's, it's Thurgood Marshall and it's Constance Baker Motley and it's, and it's Bob Carter, you know, people who had no blueprint. They weren't pointing to someplace else in the world and saying, we wanna be like that. They were making up out of their own deep, profound um, imagination at, uh, for justice, what they believed the world could be uh, for their communities. And that requires so much courage. It requires the willingness to listen. That was something very important about Dr. King. He was a great listener. Um, the importance of understanding the multiplicity of the movement. There's a role for everyone to play. Um, it's critical. I'm so glad you're gonna be talking to young people um, and young activists later today. Um, you know, so interesting. People always try to sow division within the civil rights community. And I'm always, excited about the diversity, uh, even if we're tussling with one another, how lucky we are, how blessed we are that our community is broad and diverse enough that there are enough of us and enough organizations that we can tussle with each other, that we can push one another. Um, I think it's exciting. And young people are supposed to be impatient. That's the point. They make us move faster. Uh, they are supposed to be brash. They are supposed to be bold. Um, they are a necessary part of the ecosystem of uh, civil rights activism and movements. And Dr. King understood that. Um, and, he, and so he could embrace uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. He, could, he understood that it takes all the different elements. So I try to think of it that way. And I find this very encouraging because if you're in a leadership position, uh, it's, it's quite some help to know it's not all on you. You know, you're gonna do your part. You're gonna run your part of the race. But there are others who are also running in that race and they are doing their part. And so when it gets to be super high pressure, <laughs> as it often is, um, I try to remind myself of that. I try to remind myself of the many, many colleagues I have who are doing this work around the country and around the world even, um, and that we're all kind of in this together. And um, I always love those pictures of Dr. King marching, you know, with the lays around his neck and that long line of people and so many, when you, when you zoom in on those pictures, so many different organizations are represented, you know? And, um, and that's what's important that we continue to do this work together. I have no doubt about the outcome, we're gonna win. Uh, I'm not saying it's all gonna be pretty up, up until we get there. Um, it's gonna be tough and we're facing one of the toughest moments certainly that I've seen. Um, but if we continue that, to link arms as they did in, in those marches and keep walking forward no matter what, we'll get there. Yeah, it's a great note to end on. I wanna conclude by saying thank you. Thank you, Sherilyn and Deval for joining us today. Thank you for sharing your reflections. The Dr. King holiday is a moment to draw inspiration and encouragement and you helped us do that. I also wanna extend special greetings uh, to Deval, your former colleagues here in the Civil Rights Division, we're especially pleased that you would join us for our program today. It's an honor, thank um, you. And as we close out, we talked about Lonnie Guineer. Um, we've lost so many civil rights giants over the past year, and I just wanna uh, identify a few of them. Uh, we also lost Jim Turner, a longtime uh, career civil rights lawyer in the Civil Rights Division who served for decades. Vernon Jordan, uh, who began his civil rights career after graduating from Howard Law School, led the National Urban League and did so much more. Alvin Sykes, who left high school in the eighth grade, completed his education by reading legal textbooks at the public li library, and then used his vast knowledge of the law to pry open long dor dormant murder cases from the civil rights era. He actually was a great partner to the Justice Department in connection with the work that we do through our cold case unit. Martha White, 
a black housekeeper in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, who was bone weary coming home from work one day in 1953. And as she climbed a city bus, she saw only one seat left in the whites only section. She took it and that simple and startling move in the Jim Crow South eventually planted the seeds that led to the Montgomery bus boycott in Alabama. Bob Moses, a less well-known figure from the civil rights movement who worked alongside Dr. Martin Luther King and Karen Hasty Williams, uh, the first black woman to clerk on the Supreme Court working for the late Justice Thurgood Marshall. Thank you. Thank you once again to Sherilyn Eiffel and to Governor Patrick for sharing your insights with Assistant Attorney General Clark and with all of us today. To build on those reflections, we will turn now to our next speaker, Danielle Holly Walker, who is Dean of the Howard University School of Law. Dean Holly Walker joined Howard School of Law in 2014 as the Dean and as a professor of law. She teaches a wide array of courses and her scholarship focuses on the governance of public schools, increasing access to higher education and diversity in the legal profession. She is also a fellow with the American Council of Education and serves on the boards of the Howard University Middle School for Math and Science and the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. I'm so pleased to turn the program over to Dean Holly Walker. Shahina, thank you so much for that generous introduction. And I'd like to thank Attorney General Merrick Garland, Deputy Attorney General Vanita Gupta, and Assistant Attorney General Kristen Clark for inviting me to be with you this afternoon to celebrate and commemorate the Martin Luther King Jr. Day holiday. Just like my other favorite holidays, I have important rituals and celebrations that I do around the MLK holiday. And one of them is to always read part or all of why we can't wait. I have my well-worn uh, copy with me today. And as I reflect, as I read that seminal work uh, from 1964, I'm often brought back to one word. And that one word is legacy. Legacy inspires and provides a pathway for our current and our future work. I think about the work of the great civil rights lawyers, and we've seen on this program already this afternoon, some of the most distinguished civil rights lawyers of our time. And as Dean of a historic civil rights law school, the Howard University School of Law, I think particularly about the legacy of civil rights lawyers and heroes like Charles Hamilton Houston and Thurgood Marshall. When Charles Hamilton Houston came to Howard's Law School as Vice Dean in 1929, he was deeply convinced that through work with students like Thurgood Marshall and work with faculty like Spotswood Robinson and William Hastie, that the students, faculty, and alumni of Howard University School of Law could work together with other civil rights lawyers to reshape the United States Constitution and end racial apartheid in the United States. Dean Houston was right. In 1954, the work of Thurgood Marshall and civil rights lawyers like Constance Baker Motley led to the seminal decision in Brown versus Board of Education. They laid the groundwork along with the direct action and nonviolent civil rights movement led by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The legacy of civil rights lawyering animates everything we do at Howard Law today. The, no, the notion that lawyers who are deeply committed to justice and to democracy are, is a commitment that will allow us to fully embrace all people and to make fundamental positive change in society. We celebrate and carry on Dr. King's legacy, Thurgood Marshall's legacy, Charles Houston, legacy by doing the work. We do that work with a fire that is demanded by the current terrain so hostile to the progress that we can make on many of these issues. In training long, young lawyers to practice civil rights law, we do the work. We do the work through our civil rights clinic and through our civil rights lawyering courses. We do the work 
through cutting edge research in areas from federal criminal law to fair housing to voting rights. And every day we are charged with re-envisioning, reimagining, and energizing ourselves to win these fights despite the obstacles. I hope that on this Martin Luther King Jr. holiday, we feel renewed with purpose to love justice and to do the work of justice. And I'll end with the words of Dr. King. The revolution for human rights in opening up unhealthy areas in American life and permitting a new and wholesome healing to take place Eventually, the civil rights movement will have contributed infinitely more to the nation than the eradication of racial injustice. It will have enlarged the concept of brotherhood to a vision of total interrelatedness. I wish you a happy Martin Luther King Jr. holiday weekend, and let's work together to continually do the work of justice. Thank you. Thank you so much to Dean Holly Walker for your remarks and for your work training members of the next generation of civil rights leaders. In our next panel session, we will hear from three such leaders, young people who are at the forefront of seeking change and justice in their communities. I am so pleased to turn the program over to Jonathan Newton, Deputy Chief in the Educational Opportunities Section of the Civil Rights Division, who will moderate the panel. Jonathan, the floor is yours. Thanks, Shahina. Sometimes we forget that the civil rights movement of the 1960s was powered by young people because those leaders are now our revered elders and heroes. A young 26-year-old pastor named Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. accepted the charge to lead the Montgomery bus boycott. Ruby Bridges was only six years old as she bravely desegregated her New Orleans elementary school. Diane Nash and John Lewis were just barely in their 20s when they helped found the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. So with that history in mind, today we are honored to speak with and learn from three young next generation civil rights leaders. Dakota Hall is currently the Executive Director of Alliance for Youth Action, a national network of local organizations that works with young people to engage in our democracy as voters, organizers, and leaders. In 2016, Dakota founded an organization named Leaders Igniting Transformation, or LIT, to help black and brown youth in Milwaukee achieve social, racial, and economic justice. Under Dakota's leadership, LIT successfully advocated to remove the Milwaukee Police Department from the Milwaukee Public Schools and ended the use of metal detectors on campuses and suspensions for children in elementary school. Sage Grace Dolan Sandrino is a dynamic artist, public speaker, storyteller, and organizer. Sage has been a fierce advocate for the rights of transgender youth for years. She is currently a member of the National Black Justice Coalition's Trans Advisory Board and the Advisory Board of Gucci's Chime for Change campaign. And Sage previously served on the Obama White House's Advisory Council for Transgender Youth. Sage also founded a creative studio and digital zine named The Team Mag, and has also been featured in Vogue magazine, among other publications. Stephanie Hu is a high school senior and aspiring poet who founded a nonprofit organization named Dear Asian Youth during her sophomore year. Dear Asian Youth features podcasts, social media outreach, and writing for and by Asians, and it has 180 chapters around the world. She also co-founded Capistrano Unified School District Against Racism, a student-led organization devoted to combating racism and inequality in her school system. In addition, Stephanie is also the co-executive director of the Women of Color Conference, a two-day conference that unites thousands of girls of color so they can engage with career-oriented panels and uh, connect with mentors. So welcome, Dakota, Sage, and Stephanie. As a roadmap, uh, we'll structure our conversation today in three parts. First, we'll talk about the foundations of your civil rights advocacy. Next, we'll focus on intersectionality and how you affect social change in diverse communities given your own overlapping identities. And lastly, we'll turn to the role of social media and other new platforms 
in moving civil rights forward. So let's start with the foundations first, if we can. This question is for all of you. What does Dr. King's legacy mean to you in the context of your own civil rights advocacy? And in your view, why are young people important in continuing this fight? And Dakota, we'll start with you. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, when I think about Dr. King's legacy um, to, to myself, especially in, in a moment in which we've gone through so many years of of darkness that was led by white nationalism and white supremacy um, and overall like truth denial. Um, it's really, you know, at the, at the core of it, Americans in, in history tend to look towards the young people to help create a new and better pathway forward. And MLK did that in, in his generation. And I think what we're seeing now is more and more young leaders across the nation are stepping up and providing hope um, and a pathway forward uh, in a lot of local communities. Um, and, and the broader sense of like, you know, civil rights that, you know, the, the basicness of it in terms of guaranteeing equal social opportunities and equal protection under the law, regardless of race, religion, gender, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? And, and, and that's something that MLK fought for, right? And, and, it, and it shows up differently a little bit today um, due to the nature of identities and everything that we've seen progress over the last 60 years. But I think the essence in which, uh, you know, the good reverend fought for still lives amongst a lot of young people um, overall. But I think young people over generations continuously take it a step and step further. And some of the work that I do at the Alliance is thinking about like what our North Star is and like what does it mean to do some of like the work that we're that that we've built upon the shoulders of previous civil rights leaders and creating a world in which our democracy um, is for everybody where for all people, regardless of where you are and where you come from. Um, it, it is essential, right? And I think we heard that in almost every, every MLK speech as well, too. And when I think about, you know, I think it's easy to judge the past with like current lenses, right? Um, where it's like, hmm, did MLK do everything right? We can't say that, right? Because it, we didn't have that perspective that he had living in the time that he had. And so I think often as a young activist, it's like, okay, what can I pick up um, about the values in which he um, professed publicly and lived out throughout his life um, and do some deep uh, learning and community building around some of those values around civil rights, building together a coalition of people who may not have the same common identity, but have the same common goal. Um, and a lot of what I what I remember growing up and hearing, you know, the speeches of MLK and the images of MLK um, we're a, we're a diverse group of people marching in the South um, and really making sure that they are bringing light into the darkness, bringing truth to power. Um, and I think young people across the country um, are getting more involved into civics and politics locally um, and building and supporting young leaders is what's gonna be important to really making sure that we're making impacts on these communities um, that previous panelists have talked about when we talk about hate crimes and uh, litigation and stuff like that. And every generation has a responsibility to make sure that we're leaving a better, uh, better world and a better place for those who come after us and supporting young people to be the, the, the pushers and the agitators of society to say that we could do better. Thanks, Dakota. Sage, same, same question to you. Yeah, thank you for having us. I'm really glad to be here. Um, I think as uh, Shailen so greatly articulated, right, youth are so impatient. And I definitely identify <laughs> with that sentiment as a young 21 year old creative myself. Um, I think growing up, I, I grew up in Washington, DC. So everything about my uh, childhood was very politically informed um, and activism was always on my mind. Um, and the legacy that Dr. King left was one that left me with the understanding and the impression that there is so much change that I can create with simply my voice and my body and the way I decide to use my voice and where I decide to place my body. Um, I think also that um, understanding with, you know, with time and, and learning these things that, you know, Dr. King was surrounded by queer leaders um, that we have, you know, in, throughout um, history put, erased, um, refound, um, so it's like Bayard Rustin and, and, and more folks that we may not even know the names of today, but also that, you know, queer people were and have been at the forefronts of every, you know, civil 
civil rights issue um, and and the the organizing that took place around that. So knowing that um, not only there was such an incredible foundation laid for um, youth activists, but that many of those youth activists may have potentially been queer just like myself, I think allowed me to not only align with, you know, um, a politic that I supported so heavily, but also know that there were folks like myself present then, um, and that I want to continue doing that work um, and building upon those 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 shoulders and those foundations as well in my community. Um, and so, yeah, I think that also just growing up in DC, um, I did a lot of walkouts and student organizing growing up, and all of us were were inspired by Dr. King and 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 seeing the way that you know we could get up and walk out of school in 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 droves of like hundreds and hundreds of kids and 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 walk to the Capitol and then go back to school the next day and actually see changes being made um, by by our school systems and by our administrators um, and yeah yeah that's that's my answer I'll keep it short. I see. Stephanie, does any of that resonate with you? And same question. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, I want to echo everything that Dakota and Sage said. Um, and I think the ways in which Dr. King really um, inspires my work and activism is the sacrifices and the risks he took in advancing racial justice. That really informs me in my work today um, because I think something that needs to be talked about more is Racial justice isn't easy, especially when um, for a lot of students as well, when we're student organizing, when we're, uh, we're dealing with difficult administration or difficult authority, we necessarily don't want to listen to what we have to say. It, it's not easy. Um, but I think what Dr. King really instilled in me as well as all the other students that I work alongside with is the importance of perseverance and the importance of, you know, keep trying even when things aren't so easy. Um, and, you know, as previous panelists have said, and also as um, Dakota and Sage have said, I think what is really, really amazing is um, the idea that we are all coming from such different backgrounds. We all speak different languages. We all come from different cultures. Um, we all have such different identities, but there still is that sense of solidarity amongst all of us because we have the same shared sense of purpose. Um, and I think that really reminds us the importance and power in solidarity. Stephanie, and thank you all for, for sharing those. Um, powerful thoughts as we all reflect on Dr. King's legacy uh, today. Um, the next question is, uh, again, also for, for all of you, what initially sparked your desire to affect change? And can you tell us about the work you've done and some of the key challenges that you've confronted as you have advocated for change in your communities? And uh, we'll start with you this time, Sage. Yeah, um, so I think that the kind of emphasis to my change making journey began with really three things. Um, I grew up um, in a house being raised by a black immigrant Cuban father and a white disabled mother. Um, an outlook that made me aware at a very young age just um, how severe um, the differences between the lived experiences of my parents and subsequently myself were. Um, and so when it came time for me to transition in school, um, I really understood the way that the um, my lived experience as a queer and trans person was then, you know, um, complicated um, and um, really contextualized by my racial identity, um, and I and I understood that there was such a fear that I had in showing up at school um, in the way that I did as a trans kid, um, and that that fear created a necessity in me to change um, the system that caused me to, to feel that kind of fear. Not feeling safe getting off of the school bus, not feeling safe going into school, you know, not being allowed to use the bathroom and knowing that, you know, not only was this happening to me, of course, but it was happening to every other kid like myself across the country and across the world. And so 
I then, you know, with my fear and that necessity, then I had to couple those two things with the privilege that I have of having a white mother, of being a light skin mixed woman, um, and, and having access to the medical health care that I needed in order to transition, with having access to a safe home and a community of friends that also supported me, and understanding that with my my particular positioning um, and the intersection of my disadvantage, my privileges and the unique lived experience that that left me with, that I then knew that it was my responsibility to become a change maker, to use my voice, to change the school system, to change the world um, and, and to change the culture around being um, trans, being queer, being black, being brown um, and the intersections of those identities. And so I began my my journey, you know, working with organizations local to the DC area at first, and then, you know, finally being connected with folks at the National Black Justice Coalition, Mr. David Johns, through, you know, the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for African Americans, um, and continuing to grow this um, incredible network of change makers um, and, and historic leaders that allowed me, you know, access to a, an even larger global network of young change makers who I was able to create, you know, create connections with, create community with, and ultimately create generational change alongside. Thank you, Sage, and I feel like we're all benefiting from that growth today and getting to hear your, your story, so, so thank you. Um, Stephanie, Turn it over to you. Um, what are your thoughts on, on that question? Yeah, so um, I think my story also really began um, based on the discrimination that I felt within my school system too. Um, so for a little bit of context, I actually grew up in Taiwan and then China, and then I moved um, to the States when I was in eighth grade with my brother. Um, and I would attend school and I would be labeled as, you know, like that immigrant girl um, who moved from China. And um, I would face microaggressions and discrimination by both peers and teachers alike. And that really just didn't make me feel comfortable within, um, you know, getting my education. Um, so I think, during my years in middle school and also early years in high school, that really turned me to resent my culture and be ashamed of my culture, which is something I feel like is such a shared experience across students of color. Um, and it was only when I was able to find a community of activists who um, empowered me and who showed, showed me the tools of how to empower others that I really began to um, love my culture again and, and to be proud of it. But then I, I realized that um, not everyone has access to the tools that I had. Not everyone has access to the communities that I had. Um, so that really prompted me to want to create a safe community um, for other Asian students who may have been going through similar struggles, which um, inspired me to create my organization, Dear Asian Youth, and then that kind of inspired me to launch into all the other racial justice initiatives that I um, have worked on with other people. Um, and just through this entire experience, really getting to know um, all of these young voices across the nation and getting to connect with them. And again, like coming from such different backgrounds, but still working towards the same mission, um, that inspires me to do my work every single day. Stephanie and Dakota. Yeah, and this is, I think, a really important question. I, I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, um, in, a, in a neighborhood called Harambe, uh, which means like all pulled together. And in, growing up in Harambe, which is a predominantly when I grew up there, Black and Puerto Rican neighborhood, um, you definitely saw the economic struggles um, and racial disparities that are very visible from like that versus like the neighboring uh, neighborhood, which is predominantly white. And then as you get older, you begin to like read more and you're like, oh, well, this, this is like what racial disparities means. This is why um, like our lawn look like that compared to like their lawn looking like that or like why their houses are so much bigger. And then the older I get, the more I can do like more data analysis and realize, well, you know, you live in this one neighborhood, you somehow are expected to live longer than if you live in this in the neighborhood in which I grew up in. And understanding that it's not just an individual problem, but a systematic thing, I think is what really helps spark some of that like desire to change um, and make an impact. Um, additionally, like stories from like elders and communities of color. 
um, my background is indigenous and, and black. And so growing up in Wisconsin, um, a lot of my family came from northern Wisconsin near the Lakota Ray Reservation, where they had to deal with um, rural white folks uh, and treaty rights for indigenous folks and the right over fishing. Um, and one of the starkest things I remember growing up as a child was learning that there was a campaign led by like white nationalists and white supremacists up there that literally said, you know, save a fish, spear an Indian over treaty rights around fishing, right? And understanding that these are not necessarily problems that have gone away, but that it, it's still it's still the undertone in which we've seen over the last few years. And while it's changed in terms of like in ways in, in ways in which it will show up, right? Like uh, my 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 black side grew up in in the South in Arkansas, right? And we all know that in that the Jim Crow laws were very real and like the stories around um, access to voting and literacy tests and all these other kind of things that still were happening in the 50s and 40s. Now, when I grew up in in 20 in the 2010s and tried to go vote in Wisconsin when Governor Walker was in place, now I get to see all these different voter ID laws, right? And so understanding the how it systematically has almost been the same problem for generations and generations, but it just shows up differently based on you know what's more politically palatable to some people. And so all of that has like really helped desire some of the changes that we push for locally in, 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 in Wisconsin through Leaders Igniting Transformation. And one of the biggest challenges that we've always had is the, the energy of young people um, to push a system for change has never aligned with how fast the system can change, right? And understanding that bureaucracy is real and that, you know, young people often demand change immediately, right? Like we see injustice and we want to act upon it. And then we learn that, okay, well, if that has to change, you have to go through this process and that process. Well, actually, if you want to change something at the school board level, the state still needs to approve it. And there's all these different bureaucratic processes that are not civically taught to young people. And so when you have young people who are excited and ready to engage and change the processes on something, and then they run into this brick wall known as United States bureaucracy systems, that's where we get into some, I think, some of like that, the, the tension there that historically has, has happened is like, we have elder uh, civil rights activists who have gone through that and recognized that. And then we have new emerging leaders in the civil rights space who are like, no, let's change this immediately. What are we waiting for? We know this is unjust, but it, it, there's that unique balance that I think we all have to go through. Um, yeah, I, I think that that's where I'll land on that question. Yeah, no, thank you for that. And I, I feel like Ms. Ms. Eiffel's words from, from earlier that young people are supposed to be impatient are just sort of echoing and reverberating throughout, throughout all of this. Um, in a, a good and, and positive, constructive way. So thank you, Dakota. Um, well, so each of you comes from a different background with overlapping identities rooted in different communities as you're sort of just describing. Um, so I, I wanna shift gears now to talk a little bit more about that intersectionality. Um, so Sage, from your perspective, thinking about the intersection of race, ethnicity and gender identity, what are the most important uh, issues young trans women of color in particular are confronting right now? And I guess in your view, how can art and creative expression play a role in that, that dialogue and potentially become part of the solution? Yeah, so I'm, I, I definitely in my everyday fo life focus on the narratives, the lived experiences and the, the, the challenges facing the trans community, um, especially, you know, black and brown trans women. Um, as an Afro-Latino trans woman, Apologies about that. As an Afro-Latina trans woman, um, you know, I interface with racism and transphobia um, every day. And I, there's there's no question that one of the largest crises facing us as, as trans women of color is um, not only political and, and legislative, but also cultural, right? And so when we are facing um, T awful acts of violence in the street, um, but it doesn't really stop with physical violence. We're experiencing financial violence. We are experiencing lack of access to um, health care. We're experiencing push out from our schools. We're access. We're having difficulty accessing housing. We are having difficulty um, ex existing in safe ways in our workplace. Um, and so we see that in every corner of everyday life that trans folks, trans Black women, trans Latino women are being pushed not only to the side, but to the bottom. Um, and I think that something that I like to focus on so much is that there is 
that Black issues, that Black trans issues are Black issues, um, and that Black trans people are Black people, um, and that so often we find ways to draw lines between the experiences of Black Americans and Black queer folk and Black trans folk, um, and that that line is only a line that is drawn in favor of white supremacy, and really un understanding not only on a personal level, but then educating my community, my peers, that transphobia like ableism like sexism like racism are all tools of white supremacy and that we must work together not only legislatively to change the systems that allow this violence to be so pervasive but that we must also come together and change ourselves on a cultural level right so that as as the work that i do i, I identified as an activist for a very long time and if you look my name up i'm sure you'll find me on some sort of list of activists but i don't identify as an activist because i do not align um, with the politic that right as a as an Afro Latina trans woman that everything about my existence although it is must be political and that some in some way this take on my life right must be must be radical there is nothing political or radical about my existence or the existence of my black and brown trans siblings um, and that I am working towards a, a reality in which I think it was mentioned earlier right that we are running our own races um, but that other people are doing their part too right and that that is the mentality that I need to focus on. That, that that activism is not, you know, something that we that we leave to marginalized folks to take care of their issues on their own and educate the rest of us, but that we all rise up together. Um, so I'm I'm working towards a, a future in which there is no um, label of, of 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 activism, but also you know changing the way that we interface with transness and the trans identity and the understanding of the trans black identity through the narratives that we are promoted through through the through mainstream media so if the only media that we are exposed to are narratives of trans black women being beaten being assaulted sexually being uh denied housing being de denied love being rejected by their families um that becomes the only narrative that we accept um and then normalize in the real world so behind from behind the camera as an artist um, from from you know the studio I am trying to change that reality by focusing on cultivating telling developing the narratives in which we as black and brown queer people are able to see ourselves reflected in narratives of love acceptance joy resilience and thriving um, so yeah that's that's my answer thank you Sage um, Stephanie uh, we all know the Asian community is not monolithic. There's a, a deep amount of diversity within and differences between Asian cultures. Can you share with us some examples of this cross-cultural intersectionality in, in your work and your own identity as a Chinese American? And how does your organization, Dear Asian Youth, navigate this complexity while also trying to serve as effective advocates for a broad swath of the Asian community? Yeah, so I think my organization, Dear Asian Youth, but something that we really try to embody in all of our work is holding diversity, equity, and inclusion um, as a core pillar in everything that we do. Um, and the reason that we do so is because um, as an organization, we believe and want to dispel the idea that there is only one way to be Asian or there's only one way to look Asian. Because for a lot of people, when they think of an Asian person, the first image that pops into their mind is someone who looks like me. Um, and as an East Asian person, I'm the first to say that um, I recognize and I know that in the media, I've, I've never had um, trouble being able to associate myself as being Asian. Um, I've always been automatically included in that conversation. But that is not the same reality for so many of my other Asian peers that I work with, including um, a lot of my South, West, North, Central, and Southeast Asian friends. Um, they were never, um, you know, included in the conversation surrounding Asia growing up. They were always denied their identity as um, an Asian person. And for our work at Dear Asian Youth, what we're really trying to do is include the entire Asian diaspora into this conversation. Um, because when we include people in conversation, we're also empowering them and we're bringing issues that are specific to each community to the forefront um, of everyone's attention. Um, so one thing that we have done is launched a diverse, di 
um, Diversity and Inclusion Task Force, so our DITF. Um, and they basically vet every single thing that comes out of our organization, every single thing that we publish, whether that be our literature or a podcast or social media infographics um, or any of our programs. Um, we make sure that all the work that we are producing is done through a lens that is both diverse, equitable, and inclusive to make sure that um, you know we're not contributing to the idea that Asia is a monolithic is monolithic in any way, but that we're actually dispelling that idea. Um, we have also created you know diversity syllabus. A, a diversity syllabus for our team. We've held ethical writing workshops for our writers. Um, we're hosting a diversity, equity, and inclusion workshop for all of our staff to make sure that you know they really do hold this as a core pillar and that we all recognize this as a value across our organization. Dakota, uh, both at LIT in Milwaukee and now at Alliance for Youth Action at the national level, much of your work has focused on developing young people into advocates, leaders, and organizers, empowering them to improve their communities. So what has been your approach to navigate, uh, to motivate a diverse set of young people of all backgrounds to engage both civically and politically? Uh, yeah, and, and, and this is such an amazing time for, I think, a lot of this, a lot of these conversations, because um, around the country right now, like, there, there are emerging and established political and cultural homes for young people that there have never been before in this country. Uh, I think more and more groups are, are rising up, whether they're formal groups or, you know, community-based groups, um, worker, you know, worker collaboratives, right? There, there are all these new spaces um, that young people have that like were not previously available to them. And then when I think about even like before, like there's a roadmap about how to engage young people that that happened in the 60s and 70s, whether that's through SNCC, right, the, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the NAACP Youth Council, Young Commandos, um, the American Indian Movement, the Chicano Movement, um, the Gay Liberation Movement, right, like all these movements that happened in the 60s that have now transformed into um, different political homes that you know, like young people are building and kind of learning about the history that has not been taught to them within schools, right? Like it's not like there's a curriculum that is teaching you about SNCC, right, <laughs> in the country that is like really saying this is like what this is what it looks like to be a young person and do nonviolent protest against your government, right? Like we don't do that. Um, we can get into that debate later. Um, but I also like young people more and more now have different mediums and to gauge into democracy, right? And when I say democracy, like beyond voting, but like really getting involved into their country's like core and talking about civil rights and talking about how to progress and move this country forward, where we do actually have equal protections um, for everyone. And, and, and it's not only just like legally, but like socially as well, too, because what often happens is like what is just and what is justice may not be what is written in law because we know that laws have you know have been on the books for for decades and decades and there are still some archaic laws on uh, uh in, in within states right so when we think about what it means to motivate a diverse set of young people i believe the approach is very very simple it, it's it's following the leadership of young people protect their energy because that's one of the most important things that young people have to this country is their energy to fight right and when I say like protect their energy, it's really meaning like, let's make sure that we are building a an environment in which like they can continue that and not have a bunch of naysayers like, oh, nothing's gonna change because if nothing's going to change, why are we fighting? Change has been hard. It's it's not come all at once. And sometimes we only get a little bit of change, but we, we can acknowledge that this country has changed over centuries. We want it to become quicker, but the energy of the young people must be protected. And then finally, I think the, the last approach to them is guide them with the wisdom of the past. And when I was growing up and being a young activist, one of the things that was ingrained to me from some older um, activists and uh, organizers was the Sankofa bird, right? And if you know about the Sankofa bird, it's you have the feet, uh, you have like the, the feet moving forward and the head looking back, right? And, and you, because there's an acknowledgement that in order to move forward, you must look back because these are, these are not the problems of today. These are the problems of yesterday that we're often facing. They just show up differently, like I mentioned before too. And so what I think is best for folks who don't identify as young people anymore is to really, you know, bestow that wisdom upon their learnings and the reflections of what they did when they were young and what they could have done better. And not just necessarily, 
dictate to young people, oh, you need to do it that way or this way, but really just offer that wisdom and say, hey, when I was, you know, a student at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, I had to face a similar problem. This is how I approached it. This is how I wish now that I'm older, I would have approached it and allow that young person and their energy to take that and do what they want with it and not necessarily feel like because you are older and you've gone through it that you know exactly what it is that needs to be happening, but allow a new breed of generation to really take on and, and take the next mantle and get us a little bit further than the previous generation could. Thanks. Thanks for sharing all of that, uh, Dakota. And um, for our sort of next last section, I want to pivot to uh, the role of social media and other new platforms in the current struggle for civil rights. And Stephanie, we'll start with you. Uh, Dear Asian Youth has over 100,000 Instagram subscribers, which is amazing, uh, a podcast series, webinars, workshops, and a writing platform for creative literature and opinion pieces. So um, question for you is, how do you most effectively use social media and these technology platforms to reach uh, young people and combat discrimination? And in terms of your, your content, what kinds of messages work best for a youth audience? Yeah, so when I think of our online presence, I, I like to think of it in two ways, um, both in terms of providing knowledge to um, not only Asian people, but also non-Asians, and then also um, providing a community for Asian students and Asian youth across the world. Um, so as I, I kind of previously mentioned when I was talking about um, how I got into my work in racial justice, I was lucky enough to find um, an in-person community who helped me accept my own culture, but that's not something that a lot of people have. Um, so what we really try to do is build um, an online community for people to rediscover their cultures, for people to learn and unlearn, and then through that create tangible change. Um, so we have different community spaces, we hold different bonding events, um, and there really is, um, the, the, the point of those events really is just so that um, they can find other people, even though they might live thousands and thousands of miles away, but they're still able to connect um, on a shared experience that they have, they, that they've had. Um, so that's one way that we really try to empower our audience. Um, and another way is through knowledge. I really believe that knowledge is power and knowledge is essential to democracy. Um, so what we try to do, especially through our social media or our podcasts or the literature that we, pr we produce, is take um, information that can often be complex and confusing and break them into bite-sized pieces for people to easily understand. And when we couple that um, knowledge with the personal experiences that sometimes are added to um, a lot of our literature pieces that makes it so that um, that information is personal and that the, our audience who's reading our pieces can really feel um, like they connect with what we're saying. Um, yeah, and I, I think the, the way to reach young people through social media um, is um, really, like I said, like, um, taking personal aspects of yourself and your personal experiences into whatever knowledge that you are trying to present to them um, so that they feel like they're part of a community too. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, Dakota, we're, we're running tight on time, but um, we all have the historic uh, images of the 1960s sort of seared in our minds with young people across the country exercising the tools of civil disobedience and community organizing to challenge individual prejudice in the Jim Crow laws. Uh, so question for you is how did those strategies from the 1960s influence the work you do today? And how does your organization use modern technology to empower a youth-led 21st century civil rights movement? And do you have a sense of how those strategies may continue to evolve in the future? Absolutely, and I'll try to be as quick and brief as possible with my answer <laughs> here. Um, because the strategies and influences of like the 1960s is often like what young people are working on today is like the problems that the, the last generation were unable to solve and handed down to us, right? 
and how we're able to use modern technology in terms of like whether that's social media or different organizing tools um, to help track like our metrics and stuff has been some of the most impactful things ever. It's not just necessarily reaching about reaching young people via social media, but understanding how you can combine cultural organizing, political organizing, community organizing on digital platforms, even outside of like Facebook, right? Like we know young people aren't on Facebook. And some of that work has led to like um, our group in uh, Oregon called Next Up. Um, to help pass the first voter registration automatic voter registration law in the country right to make sure that young people are automatically getting registered to vote in chicago um, our our group has helped use technology to, to inform young people about um polling locations in jail for people who are on pre-detention holds still have the right to vote let's make sure that there's a polling location for them inside of that uh, inside of cook county jail Young people led that by passing the word out through social media, through other means of digital organizing um, there. In Colorado, our group has helped um, ensure that 17 year olds um, are able to uh, register to vote, pre-register to vote by the time they turn 18 in Colorado. So youth organizers across the country are mobilizing and informing uh, other young people on various digital platforms, even outside of social media, gaming, um, computers, um, being able to connect people on their phone, innovative apps and stuff like that. So I think how it continues involves is to continuously build upon that and hand it off to the next generation which i'm called as generation alpha apparently um as they come up and i can't wait for the the millennial crew to hand it off to them and gen z and and go to their retirement homes soon enough <laughs> thanks dakota well we are uh we're we're out of time i wish and uh feel like we could continue talking with each one of you um uh for another 35 minutes i would love that but um, Sage, Dakota, Stephanie, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to speak with and, and learn from you today. And I know all of us in the division appreciate your efforts to lead this important civil rights work in your communities and, and really across the country. So um, with that, I will turn it back over to you, Shahina. Thank you so much to Sage, Stephanie, and Dakota for that discussion, but especially for your leadership, advocacy, and the work you do every day. I have the privilege now to introduce the next part of our program, a conversation between A.G. Clark and civil rights icon Fred Gray. As a very young man, just a year after graduating from Case Western Reserve University School of Law, Fred Gray represented Rosa Parks after she refused to give up her seat on a Montgomery City bus. As you'll hear in a moment, the six decade legal career that followed changed the landscape of civil rights law from voting to education to criminal justice. We are happy to share with you this pre recorded conversation between attorney Fred Gray and Assistant Attorney General Kristen Clark. Mr. Fred Gray. It is truly a pleasure and an honor to be with you here today. You are one of the nation's foremost civil rights leaders and lawyers of our time. You became a lawyer in the segregated South and over the last 65 years have taken on some of the most momentous issues of the day. You represented Claudette Colvin and Rosa Parks when they refused to move to the back of the bus to give up their seats for white passengers. You helped to ignite the Montgomery bus boycott. You brought litigation to desegregate Macon County, Alabama's all white high school. That case was expanded and ultimately led to the integration of hundreds of schools in the state. You represented peaceful protest marchers who were seeking the right to vote in the aftermath of the bloody Sunday violence that unfolded on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in the 1965 marches from Selma to Montgomery. You brought key voting rights cases that led to the principle of one man, one vote. You served as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s first civil rights attorney. And this is just a small sampling of your legal highlights. I'm honored to be here hosting this discussion with you today and look forward to having the opportunity to talk with you about your experiences during these pivotal moments and look forward to hearing your thoughts about what is yet to accomplish. Thank you for being with us. Let me first thank you for inviting me to participate 
in the celebration of this event involving the life and legacy of my, my first uh, and my representing Dr. Martin Luther King. I appreciate that. And it has a particular meaning to me personally. One, because when I look back over 67 years to be able to participate in a program celebrating the legacy <clears throat> and the life of Dr. King and to be on it with persons who are on this program today, I never dreamed that I would be invited to do it. So thank you for doing it. And secondly, I am also honored to participate in any program that celebrates the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. because I was his first civil rights lawyer. He may have had and did have a lot of lawyers after that, but I was his first lawyer beginning on December the 5th, 1955 with the beginning of the Montgomery bus boycott and continuing for 382 days and on and off from then through the time when they indicted him for allegedly failing to pay Alabama income tax then the Selma to Montgomery March. So to be able, and I was able to file that lawsuit on behalf of Jose Williams, John Lewis, Amelia Borington against the state of Alabama and filed it within 24 hours of the time when they were beaten back. So to do anything that involving, and as a result of, I'd like to believe, as a result of my working with Dr. King, and we doing it on a day-to-day -day basis, it prepared him for all the other lawyers he was gonna be. So it's happy for me to be on this program. What Martin Luther King Jr. once described you as the brilliant young Negro who later became the chief counsel for the protest movement. And you've talked about the work that you played representing Rosa Parks. You talked a little bit about your work representing Dr. King and the Montgomery Improvement Association. I'm wondering if you can say a few words about your relationship with Dr. King and what was it like to work with him? Yes, let me, let me just say that, and I'm, I'm glad you asked me that. When Dr. King came to Montgomery and began to be the pastor of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, that was in September, of 1954. Incidentally, the same month on September 7th, 1954, I was licensed to practice law in Montgomery. But I didn't know him at that time. But when he came to Montgomery, he didn't have civil rights on his mind. He had just gotten out of school, he had just gotten married. He, uh, this was his first pastorate. And the preacher, Vernon John, who had been there, pastor of that church before him, was run out of town because he was too liberal and because of some other unorthodox things that he did. So he came there really just as a preacher. It was the leadership in Montgomery who had been having problems on the buses. And while they had a lot of other problems, the buses was the real problem because most of black people had to use the buses. So he didn't come there to start a civil rights movement. And it was only after Mrs. Parks was arrested and after she had retained me to represent her, and when I went and talked with her on that evening that she was arrested, and this brings in two or three other people, and I told, and she told me that her case is set, this is Thursday evening, is set for Monday at 8.30 in the recorder's court of the city of Montgomery. She says that, and I want you to represent me. I said, fine. I said, Ms. Parks, and this is getting late in the evening of December 1st, Thursday. 
I said, you've done your, your job, but you know, Mr. Nixon and Joanne Robinson has been talking about, ever since Claudette Coggins' case, have been talking about doing something and getting the community involved. And I think if we're going to ever get the community involved, we need to try to do it. So while I'll get back in touch with you between now and Monday on your case, don't worry about anything else. We're going to try to see whether the community is ready to do something. I left Ms. Park's house and went to Mr. Nixon's house, which was only a few blocks away. He expected me because he had signed the bond so she could get out. But he was a poor man carpoter and he had to leave the next day to go on the trip for three days to Chicago as a poor man carpoter. And he said, whatever I'm gonna do, I've got to get it done. I said, well, I'm gonna leave here and, he, and talk to Joanne Robinson because she's a person who has been really the one person who felt that the community needed to be involved. She had had a problem with the buzzard back in 1948. So, and he said, well, when you talk to Ms. Robinson, you let me know and see what, you, what we ought to do. I talked to Ms. Robinson, went over to her. She lived on the other side of town where Alabama State was located. She was a professor over there. And I'd known her from my college days. And what she, we sat in her living room and made the following things that we concluded. One is that if we're going to ever get the community involved in the problem of solving it, now is the time to get them involved in this matter. Two, if that's going to happen, we have two black leaders here, E.D. Nixon and Rufus Lewis. I've told you a little something about E.D. Nixon. Rufus Lewis was a former coach at Alabama State. And uh, also had a citizens club in order to be a member, in order to get in, you had to be a registered voter. He was interested in voter registration and that. And also, he was also uh, president of a local community organization. And his wife was co-owner of the largest black funeral home in town. So I said, we're gonna need to have those two people as, uh, involved and get their support because both of them have persons and have followers and we need everybody. And of course, we're gonna to need to get the preachers involved. And the other thing we're gonna need, he says, uh, you are talking about making, having some leaflets and asking the people to stay off of the bus for one day. But if they stay off the bus for one day, you got to be prepared to keep them off longer. And ultimately, and I told her then, that it's gonna take a law student, it's gonna take a long time, but we can't tell them how long it's gonna take. But we're gonna to have to be prepared and make plans now that if we're successful with them staying off on that one day, we'll have a plan for the rest of it. And they said, well, that's fine. She said, well, if that's true, we're gonna to need to have a spokesman. And I said, well, who you think the spokesman ought to be? She said, my pastor, of uh, Martin Luther King, haven't been here long, only been here a year, but one thing he can do, he can move people with words. I said, that's fine. That's the person we need. This program features the voices of young leaders, young advocates who are offering their vision of MLK, MLK's legacy. Uh, and they're sharing their views about how Dr. King's work has inspired the work that they do today. Now, young people being on the front lines of justice is not a new thing. I know that uh, you represented and worked with Claudette Colvin, who was just 15 years old at the time, who took on the task of standing up to segregation. Share some of your views about Claudette and her courage and her bravery. On March the 2nd, 1955, Claudette Carving, 15 year old girl who lived in the part of the community known as King Hill. And I knew something about that community because the Church of Christ, the King Hill Church of Christ was located there and as a boy preacher, I had gone up there 
and preached in a very small community, only about two or three streets. And they were only about two or three blocks long. And they were surrounded by white people, uh, white community. But they had to use the city buses in order to go to the black school, which was Booker Washington on the east side of town. They would catch a bus in their community, go downtown, get another bus and go over to, to Booker Washington. On this particular day, March 2nd, and they had just had Black History Month in February, the teachers were having a meeting. So they let the students out early. So this group of Black kids who lived in the King Hill community and they all rode the same bus, city bus back there, decided since they got out early, they had just walk on downtown, it wasn't too far, and then catch the bus to go on home. When they got downtown, they caught the bus, and this was a bus earlier than they usually catch it. And when they got down in the heart of town, uh, a lot of white people began to get on the buses. Now the first 10 seats were always reserved for whites. These students were not sitting in the first 10 seats. They were sitting in seats further toward the back. But when these white people came on, the bus driver asked these kids and an adult who was in those first four seats to get up and give their seats to a white person. And Claudette, three of them got up. Claudette didn't. She says that, uh, we just got to finish and studying they're having Black History Month. And we have, I'm not sitting in the white section. I have paid my fare. So I'm not going to give up my seat. And the driver asked her again, and she still wouldn't, wouldn't give it up. He drove a little farther and had a police to come on, and they arrested Claudette. Because Claudette Carvin didn't know anything about Fred Gray. And I'd only been practicing law, what, six months, a little, little better, oh, almost a year then. But she knew, our parents knew about E.D. Nixon. E.D. Nixon, they can't, their preacher, who was Reverend Johnson, who was the pastor of Hutchinson Street Baptist Church, uh, told them to contact Mr. Nixon, Mr. Nixon contacted them, I told them to contact me. He contacted me also. They asked me to come in Claudette, to represent Claudette. So that's how I got involved in Claudette's case. But when I looked at it and they accused her of being a delinquent, because when you technically, when you are a minor, they, they don't just charge you for these offenses. They charge as being a delinquent in that you did whatever you did and they claimed that she was disorderly and that she resisted arrest. And uh, so I told her that I understood that, but the real reason why she was being arrested wasn't that she was a delinquent because she was an honored student and was, and was coming from school at the time, but the real reason was to enforce the state and city ordinance for providing for segregation. I raised those issues as my first issue in George Hill in the juvenile court of Montgomery County in Claudette Carvin's case. He was very nice and very generous, but he overruled me. He listened to the testimony and I was only able to get one of the students to testify for Claudette. And that was a, a young lady named Annie Louise, uh, uh, and Louise Price now. She was willing to come and did testify in her, in her behalf. But the court found her to be a delinquent based on unsupervised probation. So she didn't have to report to anybody. And if she didn't get in any more trouble, even though it may have been good trouble, uh, she wouldn't have to make any report. I was prepared then to file a lawsuit in federal court for Claudette because I knew that was going to ultimately be what we have to do. But the community wasn't quite ready there. 
That was my involvement. However, when they were ready sometime later after Dr. King's house had been bombed and we were ready to file the lawsuit and they retained me to do it, I contacted Claudette's parents and say, I know you are interested in getting this problem solved on the buses. We are about to file a lawsuit. If you want to be a plaintiff in it, I'll add you as a plaintiff in the lawsuit. And she is a plaintiff in the lawsuit along with the other uh, women for the desegregating of the buses in Browder versus Gale. And she has been working in area of civil rights from that time up until now, and she now lives in Texas. Mr. Gray, I wanna thank you. I wanna thank you for dedicating your life to uh, breathing uh, energy uh, into the constitution, to ensuring the rule of law, to standing up for marginalized communities. We owe you a debt of gratitude. So thank you for your service. And thank you for sharing some words and memories about Dr. King's legacy uh, with us today. We are so grateful for you. Thank you so much. Let me conclude by telling you one final thing. I leave to our young and to our old with a message that came from Congressman John Lewis. And I represented John Lewis first in the Freedom Rise and then Selma to Montgomery March. And when he uh, knew that the end was near, he ended up having his chief of staff to call me on July 8th, 2020, and he wanted to talk with me. And we talked and we had a prayer. And then I concluded by asking him, I said, Congressman, considering the great civil rights record that you have, and he even came to me and wanted me to file a lawsuit so he could go to Troy State, but his parents wouldn't agree to it. Then he still got involved in the civil rights movement up in Nashville with the Freedom Rides. But then he told me, I said, what do you want me to do? And this was on July 8th, 2020. He says, brother, keep pushing, keep going, set the record straight. So I say to all of you, including those who have benefited as a result of the work that Dr. King and Mrs. Parks and the others have done, and all others interested in civil rights, keep pushing, keep going, set the record straight and do it in a non-violent manner until justice rolled down like water and righteousness as a mighty stream. Thank you. And thanks for the invitation. And may God Thank bless you. each of you. As we approach the close of our event, I wanna thank everyone in our audience who joined us for this important conversation honoring the life and legacy of Dr. King. I feel so moved and motivated by today's program and I hope that you do too. We are now gonna hear from our final speaker, Associate Attorney General Vanita Gupta. The Associate Attorney General is a career long champion for civil rights who began her legal career at the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Before she was sworn in as the 19th Associate Attorney General, she served as the head of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. And before that, she led the Civil Rights Division under President Obama between 2014 and 2017. I am delighted to turn it over to Associate Attorney General Benita Gupta, who will conclude our program. Thank you so much, Shahina. Uh, I am truly, truly honored to join all of you today for the celebration of the life and legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And to come and speak before you to close this out after hearing the conversation between A.G. Clark and uh, the legendary uh, Fred Gray is a truly an honor uh, unto itself. Today, we not only lift up all that Dr. King did for our nation, 
but we remember that his work has not yet been completed. We recommit ourselves to our common project of building a more perfect, a more equal union. Dr. King dreamed of a nation where his four little children would not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And as the first daughter of immigrant parents and as the first woman of color to serve as the Associate Attorney General of the United States, I consider myself one of the children born from Dr. King's dream. Every day, the amazing staff at the Civil Rights Division and throughout the Department of Justice, we are working to make Dr. King's dream of America a reality. Dr. King's moral leadership continues to serve as a beacon for us today especially as our nation grapples with many of the same urgent questions, questions about equality, justice, and democracy that Dr. King so powerfully answered. Dr. King's life exemplifies the transformative power of moral courage and resilience. When faced with unrelenting, brutal opposition, Dr. King never succumbed to fear or despair. Instead, he turned to his unwavering faith in nonviolent action, redemption, and love. The mass demonstrations Dr. King organized and the nation's collective horror at the heinous violence directed at peaceful protesters ushered in the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, and in 1968, galvanized into action by Dr. King's tragic assassination President Johnson signed the Fair Housing Act into law. Over the last half century, the department has worked tirelessly to honor Dr. King's legacy by enforcing the laws that he championed and protecting the most vulnerable among us. We vigorously safeguard the right to vote. We ensure that people have equal opportunity to get an education, choose where to live, earn a living, get a loan and worship freely. We build trust between communities and law enforcement by supporting community policing and where violations occur, holding departments and officers accountable. And we make sure that people can live free from exploitation, discrimination, and violence, regardless of their race or ethnicity, regardless of their religion or their disability or how they identify or who they love. But as Dr. King well knew, the path towards justice is rarely straightforward or smooth. Our nation stands at a critical juncture that will define the arc of our democracy for years to come. The summer of 2020 saw diverse coalitions take to the streets, demanding justice for communities of color. The pandemic revealed deep schisms in our society and saw a troubling rise in hate crimes. And just one week ago, we marked the anniversary of the attack on the US Capitol that interrupted a fundamental element of American democracy the peaceful transfer of power. Although the attack was ultimately unsuccessful, it serves as a stark reminder that each of us must commit to defending this democracy of ours. In calling for the passage of voting rights legislation, Dr. King declared that the denial of the sacred right to vote is a tragic betrayal of the highest mandates of our democratic traditions. Yet in recent months, states across the country have enacted a rash of laws that erect barriers for millions of eligible voters to cast their ballot and to elect representatives of their choosing. The department has vigorously responded, including by initiating lawsuits to challenge laws that discriminate on the basis of race and disability, filing statements of interest to support the work of partners across the country, and issuing guidance to make clear that jurisdictions must comply with the voting rights laws as they redraw district lines, develop voting procedures, and engage in post-election audits. The department stands ready to do all that it can to protect the right to vote and to ensure that all lawful votes are counted. However, to be most effective, we need Congress to give the department the laws we need to ensure that every eligible voter can cast a vote that counts. As we face these challenges of our time, let us draw strength from Dr. King's eternal hope for this country. He exhorted America to remember, as we remind each other today, and especially as the young people remind us every day, the fierce urgency of now. We've heard it from this incredible list of speakers in today's program. Dr. King said, now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. 
Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all. So let us act together with the fierce urgency of now until every person in this country can share in the free and fair and just America that Dr. King dreamed of. Thank you all for joining us today to commemorate Dr. King's life. And I wanna extend a special thanks to the Civil Rights Division for organizing this extraordinary event. We in the department look forward to working with you to advance civil rights in honor of his legacy. Thank you.